good to, to, to be here, to gather together as the people of God, to worship, to sing praise um, to God. So I'm just happy for our time this morning. If you're a guest with us, I just want to say thank you again for being here. Um, it really is an honor for us to, to have you with us. We count you as a blessing. We really do. We are honored by your, your presence with us this morning. So thanks for that. Um, so again, we're continuing on in this series. We're calling Game On. Um, we've looked at some, you know, we've looked at a crazy game called Quelf. Uh, just talking about joy and having fun in life and the gifts God has given us. Um, we looked at Jenga, <coughs> talking about you know, Christ is our foundation. And then last week, Chris led us through Candyland, talking about the, sometimes we get. Um, handed cards in life that move us forward or backwards, but God is with us through the process. So it's been a really fun series. I know if you're a guest this morning and we're talking about games, it might feel a little strange, um, but I hope you'll stick with us. In the end, it's always about Jesus. So that's the good news. That's kind of the spoiler for it all. Um, we always are going to bring it back to the person of Jesus because that's where our hope is. That's where our life is found. So um, we're going to jump right in this morning. We are talking about the board game called Life. I don't know if we got that slide available, a picture of that board. How many of y'all have played the game of life? All right, cool. Yeah. So hopefully uh, that's, that was the vast majority. Of it. It's a super popular game. Um, it's, a, it's one of the true classic board games. It actually made its way into the Smithsonian. That's impressive. Anybody want to take a guess at when the game was first made? 70. What was that? 70. All right. What was 65. that? All right. Back further. 42. Further. 1860 was the original game made by who else? Milton Bradley. Not the company, the actual dude. Like, he made the game, right? That was one of his games, Milton Bradley. I didn't even know that, hey, wait, Milton Bradley was an actual person. And he made the first version of the game of life. Um, it was played on a checkerboard. It took you from infancy to retirement. Then on the 100-year anniversary, 1960, that's when we get the more common version of life that we all have known to enjoy today. So uh, it's kind of interesting, um, but basically the game of life attempts to reflect real life um, decisions and, and events that take place. You kind of make a decision from going to college to getting married to raising a, a family to whether or not to have kids and how many kids, buy a home, you retire. It just kind of walks you through in, in a game all those different stages and decisions in life. And you move, you know, you spin a wheel or you move forward and sometimes you have to move backwards. And uh, there's those, those forks in the road. I don't know if you remember that. There's these intersections where you have to make that, that big decision. You know, which, do I go to college and spend money or do I start working now and make it like, and there's kind of a risk reward thing going on through the game. Um, but it is, it's a, uh, you know, and then at the end, the object to win the game is, you know, whoever has the biggest net worth at the end. And so whoever, whoever has the most at the end is declared the winner. Um, and that's a pretty common picture of how a lot of us um, go through life. That's, that's a pretty common scorecard that people use. But I do think uh, another part of the appeal of this game is that you kind of get to have that dream life. You get to get the job, go to school, and things always happen just so. Um, you kind of get to pursue the American dream, so to speak, through this little game. And um, as we look at that this morning, um, we've all we've all kind of been taught to pursue the American dream, whether that's intentional or not. It's just kind of culture kind of impresses that upon us. And so we're going to take some time this morning just to look at the scorecard that we're using to gauge, you know, hey, am I really experiencing life? Um, is it the right scorecard? Do we need to correct our definition of 
what life truly is. So that's kind of where we're going. We're going to look at two main questions. Where are you looking for life? We're all looking for life somewhere. Where are you looking for life? And then where can we find life? So that's where we're going to spend our time this morning. John 17.3 says this. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that we get to gather together as people um, that you love. We're thankful that we are able to sing songs of praise. We know that you're worthy of that. And so I just ask that you would use this time to speak to our hearts, that you would reveal to us um, where we're really looking and running towards to find life. And that you would also be so good and gracious as to, to teach us about life. We believe you have a lot to say on the subject. And so we ask these things in, in Jesus' name. When you think of someone who you would say is really winning at life, who are the kinds of people that you tend to think of? So when you think of someone who's just really, they're really winning at life, not the board game, they're really, they're doing it. Who, who do you tend to think of? What kind of people is that? Is it, is it some kind of superstar, some kind of maybe an athlete? Maybe music, musical artist, actor, Hollywood. That's probably where most people end up thinking, is some type of superstar, fame, fortune kind of person. Um, and they're kind of living out that American dream. They've kind of arrived at that American dream. They seem to have it all, right? Um, Tom Brady might fall into that category. As most of you probably know, Tom, Tom Brady is a um, well-accomplished athlete. He's, he's kind of one of those guys who seems to have it all. Like, you know, it's, it's kind of depressing when I, if I were to kind of compare myself to him. Like, he's quite a bit taller than me. He's stronger than me. He's better looking than me. Like, uh, he's kind of just uh, got it all together. He, you know, he went to the right school, got drafted. He's been... MVP, league MVP, Super Bowl MVP, right? He's, he's had all these accomplishments. Check this. His other job, when he's not being a superstar quarterback for the NFL, he's a model, right? I mean, it's just like, are you serious? Like, come on. Like, he, uh, he, married, a, he married a supermodel. Um, I also married a supermodel. <laughs> no, true story. Uh, Kara was a child shampoo hair model for like one photo session or something. So, so, so see me and Tom, or me and Tom Brady have that in common, right? Both very much. Um, something we don't have in common, his net worth is about 200 million. So uh, I don't even want to look in my pocket right now, but we'll just say it's not that, right? So, so he, he's kind of one of those guys that like, man, he's got it all. He has arrived. Like the game of life, he's, He's get, he gets to retire at the Millionaire Mansion. He's, he's done it. And, and yet, he admits there's something missing. It's interesting. You can, uh, one of the interviews that he did when he was still, it's probably some years ago, he's pretty young. He'd already won uh, three uh, Super, Super Bowls. So that's the other thing. He, he's won four Super Bowls already. That's four more than me. Uh, but at this point in the interview, he, he'd won three. And, uh, and, you know, he just kind of, just, wow, like, you're awesome. Like, what's up? How's that? What's that like? Tell us common folk about that. You know? And so, and he kind of says this. He's like, you know what? Even with all the super, he, said, he says something's missing. He admits that there's, it's not what he thought it was going to be. He really thought that, you know, getting to this place that he, had, that he was young, he's good looking, he's money, all, all of that. He, he really thought it would be something there. He said, there's something missing. And the interviewer 
So what's the answer? I wish I knew. That's what he says. I wish I knew. Isn't that something? You see, the American dream offers us life, but it's really a lie. It's a lie. There's no life there. It's an awful definition or comparison to life. It's, it's just not true. It's garbage. And yet so often, that's what we pursue, hoping to find life. And ironic, ironically, by pursuing that, we end up in our life. Think about some of the other people that, that, that might have achieved that. We think about Hollywood. You see all the chaos of their lives. Drug abuse, people dying from overdose. Just a couple years ago, we, we lost Robin Williams. What a star. What a star. He had it all. He was a talented actor. He was an award-winning director. He was a writer. His movies had critical acclaim. He was knocking it out of the park. He was winning in life. He's funny, fame, fortune, yet family. And yet, yet what? It was empty. It was empty. There was no life to be had there. It was lifeless to the point that he didn't want to live anymore. He didn't feel as though he could go on with that emptiness. You know, I really do think that must be one of the most depressing places to end up. To pursue something so hard your whole life. Going through the game of life, making the right decisions, putting in the hard work, sacrifice to get to that place. And then when you arrive, you realize you've been fooled. It was a sham. The book of Ecclesiastes is a case study on this subject. Solomon, he's a king, he was rich, and he, he kind of did this test. He went on this pleasure binge so to speak. Um, he looked for pleasure anywhere and everywhere, in wisdom and knowledge and leisure and um, <coughs> healthy living and, um, and, and work. He went, he went for a hunt on real life. And we can read about that in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 4 through 11. It's, it's not going to come up on your screen, so if you guys want to follow along with that, that'd be great. Device, your Bible, Ecclesiastes 2, 4 through 11. If you find Psalms and Proverbs, you're on the right track. But it says this in verse 4. I made great works. I built houses. And planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks, and planted them, and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the children of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was the re reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Kind of a depressing picture. But if you read this short book, you know, it's just a few chapters long. It's him going on these, these, this, this experiment, really. Trying to find pleasure and meaning in life. 
in all these different spheres. And, and, and the theme, the refrain through the whole book is it's all vanity. And it's all trying to, trying to grasp the wind. It's, it, there's nothing there to get. You can't get it. Where are you looking for life? Where are you looking for life? Where do you run to to try and find life? Think about that for a minute. How's that going for you? How's that going for you? C.S. Lewis says this. If we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another one. It's pretty insightful. When we, when we try to find life in all these different areas and, and, and we come up empty, maybe that should point us to something beyond this world. Maybe it should point us to something that eyes can't see. Maybe it should point us to something that, that we can't obtain. It points us beyond ourselves. So our second question is, where, where do we find life? Is life truly available to us, that real, satisfying life? Yes. And it's not that far into God's word that we come across that. In, in Genesis 2, 7, I love this verse. This one might come up. Genesis 2, 7, it says this. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. It's just a few pages in that we begin to see where life is found. Where we get to see the source. God is the creator of life. He's the sustainer of life. He's the giver of life. That's where, that's where we're drawn back to. We were designed for relationship with him. We were designed to be connected to this life-giving God. And yet we've been separated by sin. Sin has created that barrier that prevents us from, from being in union and being connected to this life-giving God. Apart from God, we're, we have form, but we're lifeless. Just like in, in verse 7, it says, He formed the man of the dust. But it wasn't until God breathed life into him that he became alive. That's a picture of the gospel. It's a picture of the gospel. The good news of Jesus is that because of his life and his death and his resurrection, we can be resurrected from death to real life. We can have life. We can once again be restored to the God of life. That's good news. Chris read John 14, 6 uh, this morning to start our time together. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That Jesus has, has made a way that we can be back in right relationship with the Father. That is good news. Jesus himself says this in John 10, 10. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's a pretty sobering first part of that verse. It's pretty sobering to realize that there is a there is a real enemy who wants you to believe that there's nothing more to life than what you can see. There is a there's a real enemy that wants to steal life away from you. He wants to put life to death. He wants to destroy your life. That's a pretty sobering verse. It's a pretty sobering statement. But we're thankful that it doesn't stop there. 
I came, Jesus came, that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's good news. That is good news that he has come to invite you into life. To invite you into life. He wants you to have and experience fullness of life. And that simply means being in a real relationship with him. One that's based on love and grace that he has offered to us through his death on the cross. And we can be in that relationship. I remember when uh, John, when God made John 10, 10, like real in my heart. Um, it was the summer of 2006. I had just finished my junior year at ETSU. Um, I went to college just because I came to that fork in the road. I came to that fork in the road and a decision had to be made, kind of like in the board game of life. Do you go, do you not? People were going. I thought that was gonna put me in the right position. It was gonna step me up in my pursuit of that American dream. So I went. I'm in my junior year, finished my junior year, still have no clue what I'm doing with my life. Some people there say, hey, you know, you should go on this, uh, this summer mission trip. You know, it was, they had been through it and they just kept like almost pestering me to do that. You should really go, man. You should really go. It, it would really help you out. And then like, they just kind of like wore me down, I think. And then I ended up getting a passport and going to the Philippines for the summer. And uh, that's where God thankfully wrecked my life. That's where God thankfully wrecked my life. That's where he crushed the American dream in my heart. And I thank him for it. It's funny to think about. Um, we lived under a metal roof. It was like a, just a pavilion. We lived in uh, mosquito nets because the mosquitoes are ferocious over there. Uh, we, we ate rice and beans every day. We worked like crazy and we sweated like crazy. We were part of an agriculture team, so we were just doing uh, planting trees, we were building stuff, and we were, we were, and we were it was, was kind of, when you think about it, it was kind of like the opposite of the American dream. Like, if we looked at it with the old scorecard, you got a crummy house, you eat crummy food, you got a crummy job, you should be miserable. And you know what I found? That was the most life-giving experience in my life. I had never been so satisfied in life, with life. Why? Because Jesus was in the picture. Jesus made all the difference. There is real life in following Jesus. We had a team devotional each day. We spent time talking about the devotional at night, kind of debriefing the day. We had scripture that we would memorize. Um, we would work together, live together, uh, bathe together at buckets. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it was a bonding time, right? And we shared the gospel with people in villages that never heard his name. They never heard the name of Jesus. We discipled a family and saw them baptized. We saw the joy that came to them with the new life in Christ. And in doing so, we, we began experiencing this fullness of life as we followed faithfully. We walked faithfully with Jesus. Probably one of the most spiritually impacting two months of my, of my life. Totally, totally diverted me. Totally changed direction from there on out. And so our, our bottom line this morning is this. The only way to win at life is to live for the one who gives you life. The only way to win at life is to live for the one who gives you life. So I just want to encourage you with a, with a couple of next steps. If you're here today and you really feel that, maybe you feel that gap in your own heart. You feel that, that restlessness, that dis, 
satisfaction in life, that there's something missing there, I, I'd really challenge you to, to spend some time reading through the Gospel of John. I don't think there's a book of the Bible that spends more time and really um, concentrates on this topic of life and the life that is available to us because of Jesus than John does. He kind of summarizes his whole book uh, in John 20, 31. He says this. He's saying, hey, this is why I wrote this. But these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. Do you realize God wants that for you? God wants you to have that life. In just a few moments, we're going to be taking communion. We'll have the opportunity to take communion together as a people of God. Communion is for people who are putting their faith in Jesus. They, they, they are committing themselves to following Jesus. Um, and it's just a, a chance for, for, for followers to be reminded that he is our life. In, in John 6, 53, he, he says some pretty um, prof like crazy, crazy things if we don't understand it. In John 6, 53, he says this. This is Jesus speaking. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. There, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. So I want you just to be, uh, to think about that. He's talking about his body has been broken. His blood has been spilled out on the cross. That we can have life. And so as, as you have the chance to, to come to the table, I just ask that you, you would come with that in mind. That he has invited you in. He is inviting you to come and experience his goodness. Experience the life that he offers to you. Some questions be thinking about as they sing the next couple songs. Where are you looking for life? We're all looking for life somewhere. Where are you looking for life? How's that going for you? Is that working out? Do you feel like you have an abundance of life? Fullness of life? Is it rich? Jesus wants it to be. Some of you might answer no because you don't know the Father. You don't have that right relationship with Him through Jesus. And you need that. You want that. There's no better way to respond to the gospel than to come to the table in faith, putting your faith in His body and His sacrifice. It's good enough to, to restore us to the Father. Christians here, what prevents you from fully following Jesus? What prevents you from fully experiencing the life that comes with following Him? Is there an idol of safety? Comfort? Is it just your religious, social stuff? What's going on? Gary's going to play the next couple songs. I really just want you to think about that. And um, the table.